Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, David Peralt from MIT. And today he's gonna be talking about uh, methods for high frequency, high density power conversion. And uh, we also should congratulate Dave because he just was elected to the National Academy of Engineering <laughs> here in 2021. So that's really awesome. And for his contributions in high frequency power electronics. Um, so just a quick bio about him. So he got his uh, BS and actually all of his degrees from MIT in electrical engineering. Um, he's presently the, the Joseph F. and Nancy P. Keithley professor in the department. His research uh, interests are in design, manufacturing, and control of power electronics and their components and their use in a wide range of applications. He's a fellow of the IEEE um, and numerous awards. And so uh, Dave, uh, feel free to take it away from here. Great, well, thank you very much for the really kind introduction and for the invitation. I wish I could I could be with you guys in person. I, I, I love Seattle as a city, but uh, it's at least really wonderful to be virtually with you. Uh, so today what I thought I'd do is try to give you a sense of what I see as some of, first the challenges and the opportunities in the design of power electronics. And of course, you know, as people at, at Washington will be very familiar, all kinds of systems are limited by energy and how it's controlled and processed. Um, whether that's for lighting, computation, transportation, generation, distribution, all of these uh, areas really are increasingly relying on power electronics. Now, if you look at broadly across all these applications, what are the needs for better power electronics? First, it's miniaturization, which I broadly categorize to mean either smaller or lighter, depending upon what your application is, or more integrated fabrication. Higher efficiency, not only for higher efficiency converters, but can you make the system use less energy by having better power electronics? Higher performance, which what that means depends upon the system. So for example, sometimes higher transient response or bandwidth can benefit a system. And lastly, there's a lot of needs straight in the application space. There, there's an opportunity with better ability to control energy to create entirely new system opportunities. And so this is really what my group's focused on is developing and applying technologies for improved power conversion. Now, as many of you be familiar, in power electronics as compared to many kind of electronic systems, it's really the passive components, the energy storage elements that tend to dominate the size, the weight, and the loss of power electronics. So this is one example, which is an Apple uh, MacBook charger, but the same kind of challenge applies across the spectrum of size and power. And you're limited both by the, tends to be the power stage, the fundamental part that's actually doing the energy conversion transformation and the filtering, okay? And in this, the magnetic elements, inductors and transformers are probably the most challenging things to miniaturize. And most converters require magnetics because there's something where you can put a volta instantaneous voltage difference across it and it absorbs instead of dissipates energy. So why is the magnetics a real challenge? Well, it's because the fundamental scaling laws work against miniaturizing magnetic-based systems. Just to give you a simple example of why this is true, let's just consider like a, an inductor designed for a single AC frequency. So if I thought of the power handling capability of an inductor as its volt ampere capability, we can write its voltage in terms of sort of flux density and frequency and core area. And we can write its current in terms of the current density and the area of the window in which we're carrying it. Okay, so if I put those together, what I get is a volt ampere capability under some simplified assumptions about usage of the materials, proportional to the frequency I'm operating at, proportional to the flux density I can use in the core, the current density I can use in the winding, and the linear dimension to the fourth power, the product of the core cross-sectional area and the window area, okay? So if I have volume that goes as linear dimension cubed, and power handling, it goes as linear dimension to the fourth. That means as I scale down size, not only do I lose power handling capability, which I kind of expect, I also lose power density. The power density scales with linear dimension. 
I like to think of this as sort of the anti Moore's law of power electronics. You make it smaller, everything gets worse. Okay, so this is kind of a fundamental challenge if you want systems that are smaller, lighter, and or the same size and weight but achieve higher performance. So, you know, we have this anti Moore's law that we're kind of it's kind of fundamental and we're kind of fighting against it. What do we have uh, sort of in our repertoire that we can use? Well, we have improvements in the semiconductor devices and in integrated circuits controls, better magnetic materials, better packaging, all of which we can sort of use to our advantage to combat this anti Moore's law, right? So if I look at how we could leverage those, one direction is much higher frequency power converters. We saw on the last slide that you know, power handling is at least nominally proportional to frequency. Well, if I can go much higher frequency, maybe I can sort of handle more power in a given volume. We can go for improved passive components in integration using better materials, better component designs, better ways to construct them, or maybe we can even find some other way to store energy instead of magnetically. It's also possible to go to much more sophisticated circuit designs. Historically, people were very constrained by the difficulty of controlling things or by sort of the number of components that you can put in a system being a limiting factor. Uh, with greater sophistication, that's less true. So maybe we can find ways to better utilize our ener the energy storage we have and hence make the system smaller. And lastly, because we can improve all these things, maybe we can go after new applications with power electronics, enable functions that we couldn't do before. So today, what I'm gonna to try to do is touch on, at least touch on all of these points. So um, I said, ideally, you know, going up in frequency is a great idea. And that's because this VA capability was proportional to frequency, right? Unfortunately, it's also you know, that's, it's not strictly proportional to frequency because other elements here, like the allowable flux density and current density are also functions of frequency. So if I think about core loss being a function of frequency, if I took an inductor for a given application, say I wanted to create a certain impedance and I just changed the frequency I was operating at, and this is with a given kind of core material, and I put a sort of a quality factor, a loss limit on it, a temperature limit on it, things like that, what I would see is that initially the size of the inductor would indeed decrease as I go up in frequency. Eventually I hit a temperature limit and then because core loss grows very quickly with frequency in a given material, I'll become loss limited. And in fact, actually the inductor will get bigger instead of smaller. So the idea is in theory, we can go up in frequency, but you know, we also hit other constraints where losses, especially core losses and to an extent winding losses tend to limit us. Now, for that reason, uh, because we see this frequency times allowable flux density as a factor in the power handling capability, there's a, a metric called uh, performance factor, which really relates to magnetic materials. And the, the performance factor is sort of the frequency times the flux density at which you get some loss density in the material, okay? It's something you can measure, and that sort of proportional to what you might expect you could build, get for power handling at constant loss density and volume. Okay, so it's a, it's a metric for magnetic materials, we're picking magnetic materials, okay? And what I've done here is I've plotted uh, this performance factor versus frequency for a whole bunch of materials. And the, the ones in light purple are ones that have traditionally been used in power electronics applications, okay? In the open purples diamonds. And you can see, you know, once you get up to a sort of about a megahertz, it's pretty flat, right? So you're going to pay a lot of effort to go up in frequency there. So maybe you wouldn't want to do that because you're not really getting much in the way of performance. On the other hand, if you look around and you go out and check out some materials that aren't traditionally used, you can find some low permeability magnetic materials, typically nickel zinc materials that have been used in RF applications uh, that actually do do much better and they keeps getting better to at least 10 megahertz, maybe 30 megahertz, okay? And I should say, by the way, that now there are people are coming out with power materials that are sort of in the few megahertz space, and it seems to be moving up. You know, this sort of log jam of available materials is sort of breaking open, okay? So what does that mean? 
that means even though most power electronic systems are sort of in the 100 kilohertz and down, and that depends, you know, the higher the power, the higher the voltage, the lower the frequency for a variety of reasons, but you know, people tend to design in the hundreds of kilohertz and down. What this says is that there is a continued opportunity for miniaturization uh, to at least power 10 megahertz and perhaps higher. Um, the power stage, which is limited by core loss, you know, sort of benefits as that much as that performance factor shows. Other components like filters can scale free with, freely with frequency and get really, really small if we can push up frequency. Okay, so this is sort of an opportunity. Even though we have core loss limits, it looks like we can get more by going to higher frequencies. Now, there's still challenges, right? What I showed you was a material metric. I didn't show you how you could use that material to get to high performance. And in fact, design of power magnetics at high frequencies, say three to 30 megahertz, remains a pretty high impact research challenge from my perspective. Um, one thing is we have to figure out how to leverage these materials that are good at those frequencies, which tend to have very low permeabilities. The second is we really have to adjust things like skin and proximity effects. If you think about it, the skin depth in copper at 10 megahertz is on the order of 20 microns, right? So if you wanna carry a lot of current, and you only have 20 microns of skim depth, that's difficult. It's especially challenging when you think about things like Litz wire because of the availability of wires it tends to become ineffective above a few megahertz. So one of the avenues we've been pursuing is trying to develop better magnetics at these frequencies and then better circuits that can utilize them. So what are the challenges? Okay, let's assume we can get our hands on these better materials, and you can. In fact, they're even starting to make conventional cores in these materials. Um, what are the other challenges? Well, let's look at these uh, winding loss or conduction loss challenges. If I look at a conventional magnetic design, either a rod core like this or a pod core, what we see is that the fields around the windings tend to be imbalanced as illustrated here. So if I think of this as the cross section of the winding and the imbalance of the fields means that the currents tend to concentrate towards the high side of the field, okay? That means that you have a lot of loss relative to the amount of current you're carrying. On the other hand, if you could make the fields in the conductors very balanced, you can do a much better job of distributing the net current across the conductor and do a, effectively a much better job of carrying the current with a, an available amount of conductor, okay? Another limit that you run into is proximity effect. In other words, for example, if I have a gap in my magnetic core somewhere, which I do to store energy, um, fringing from that gap can hit your winding and that induces loss in the winding here, okay? And it turns out that those winding losses are extremely sensitive to frequency. They often go up as frequency squared for a given thickness of conductor, uh, at, le at least over some range. And the result of that is, is high free it's really hard to design at high frequencies when you have very thin skin depths and, so you, and, and very fast growth of, growth of loss of frequency. On the other hand, if you can do things like uh, distributed gaps, or quasi-distributed gaps like this, perhaps we can avoid the large fringing and hence reduce the proximity effect loss in our conductors. And you say, well, okay, can this kind of strategy improve our designs? And the answer is, if you can do the right kind of design, it can really have a big impact. So let's take a look at this. This is a, uh, a, an approach that addresses both using quasi-distributed gaps uh, to influence both um, co uh, both core loss, we can better distribute the core loss and proximity effect loss and balance conduction to improve the skin effect loss. And we do that basically by controlling the relative reluctances of the center post and the outer post into this sort of pot core style design using single layer windings. And what we find is if we do that, this is an example inductor, it's at three megahertz. It's simulated Q is on the order of a thousand. It's experimental Q is about 980. Now, for those of you who think about these kind of things, that's an extraordinarily high Q in a small volume. Better still, it scales because we're using basically stacked distributed gap core pieces with only a few core pieces, we can construct inductors that'll cover a large space in both inductance and power handling capability. Okay, so you can sort of uh, develop a family of magnetics that will cover a wide space at extremely high frequencies. And I should say,
Uh, just by way of comparison, if you look at these designs, and you compare them to the best thing you can do with the same materials, the same high performance materials, but conventional say pod or EQ core designs, you get about a factor two higher in Q or half the loss. And you get a power handling capability improvement at constant temperature rise of about a factor of 1.8, right? So we're talking about a pretty big jump in performance by adopting techniques that let you uh, go up in frequency. And I should say, you know, these are relatively low currents. There are a few megahertz and a few amps. You can use these same ideas to get to much higher frequencies and power. So this inductor here is designed for 70 amps and 13 megahertz. So you know it gets about five kilovolts across that winding. And it, it has a Q on the order of 1200, right? So this is a space where people would traditionally just use coreless inductors. But if we use these kind of design principles, we can actually make much better inductors. And I should say, by the way, these are just first steps. There's a lot of room to do better magnetics. And we're going to have to because we really need to be able to take advantage of the frequency increases that have become possible. Now, uh, there's a lot of other things you got to do to use these things, right? You got to build converters that can take advantage of these frequencies. This is just one example I'm trying to to illustrate that actually, as you can see down here, it uses this exact inductor in the converter, which is a power factor correction converter. This is what would go in between the grid and a typical computer or a server, for example. Um, and this design, first of all, it, it's 98% efficient, okay? And that's what's required in this kind of application to get to sort of acceptable efficiencies because that's what the industry demands these days, okay? Because people demand high efficiencies, typical industry designs are running in the 100 kilohertz range and they have very low power densities, typically 10 or 20 or maybe 30 watts per inch cubed. Well, by pushing up the frequency to the one to three megahertz range, maybe sort of a factor of 10 higher in frequency, we get up to about 80 watts per inch cubed, okay? So this just shows you if you can design the circuit to go with the magnetic component, you can get to much higher densities than people are used to, okay? But what do you need to do? Well, we have system architectures. As a, we've chosen a, an approach that gives us very flexible control that minimizes the amount of energy conversion. That helps us, and that's why we prefer to come out at 200 volts instead of 400 volts, like a traditional PFC, because we get higher efficiency. Um, we need circuit designs that can run efficiently at HF. So this is a zero voltage switched design that runs over a wide range. Uh, we also have to handle like high frequency sensing. Current sensing at high frequency is really difficult. We implement that by not requiring current sensing because of the, the way the architecture works. We also have uh, things like special driving techniques and step down techniques. There's a whole bunch of analog circuit design and control techniques to go into making this kind of thing run. And that's what you have to put together with the magnetics in order to take advantage of them. But if you do that, you can get to very high performance. That's one kind of approach you can take. Really push frequency, improve the passives, design better circuits running at high frequency. Another approach you might think of is say, well, perhaps we can get rid of magnetics, right? Magnetics scale badly. Maybe I can just find a way to eliminate them, okay? And uh, one way we might think of that is storing energy in some other form, right? So magnetic storing in a magnetic field, maybe we could store it in mechanical form, either in, in, the, in the stress or the strain, inertia or compliance uh, of a material, okay? So this figure here actually shows the electrical circuit diagram of a piezoelectric resonator. It has the actual capacitance of the piezoelectric piece, right? It's the, the physical capacitance. But then this other branch really reflects electromechanical transduction between the electrical domain and the me mechanical domain. And you get a traveling wave in the material. The inductance represents the inertia and the capacitance represents the compliance of the material. And if you do it right, you can sort of resonate this thing. And maybe we can take advantage of this effective inductor in some circuit design, okay? Now, I should say that the, the motivation for this is first of all, raw material numbers will suggest you, you have the potential for very high power densities. 
piezoelectrics have very different scaling properties than magnetics because the physics is different. So you have hopefully scaling the small, si small size and the potential for better fabrication because these materials can be constructed in planar formats. Okay. Now, I should say that the notion of using piezoelectric energy storage and power conversion is far, far from new. In fact, maybe 20 to 30 years ago, uh, they were piezoelectric transformers were very heavily used in um, powering cold cathode fluorescent lamps. Now they were traditionally used with magnetics to provide matching into the circuit. And they used the piezoelectrics as the transformer to get voltage gain. Nonetheless, they were de deployed in the tens of millions commercially. So, you know, what that shows is that you can use these kind of materials in large commercial production, and they are still used in, in actuators and sensors and things like that, just not for power conversion. Now, um, why didn't they make the transition, right? When CCFL sort of went down, piezoelectric never made the transition to high density, high performance power electronics, probably for a few reasons. First of all, at the time, there was very little understanding of magnetics free topologies, right? So, or operating modes, how can you use them or control methods? How could you use these materials to do that? And as long as you're going to still have magnetics in your circuit, you're not doing yourself very many favors by using the piezoelectrics in terms of getting high density. There was also surprisingly little understanding of material performance or how to select materials for very high performance because it wasn't necessary previously. There's also, it turns out, very little understanding of resonator or even transformer design and construction for high frequencies and power densities. Okay, so there are a range of limitations that exist on using these materials, despite the fundamental promise for them across a wide range. Okay, so one of the things my groups set out to do is start to look at and address these challenges. Okay, so let me talk about how we're going about that. The first thing we said was, okay, if we're going to have piezoelectric elements, they have this thing where they have a big capacitance in parallel with an LC tank. How can I use that element? as a circuit element to transfer energy. And let me find not just one way to do it, but all the ways we could do this. So we said, all right, well, what we need to do is we need to take these elements and we're gonna connect it at some time between an input voltage and some time to an output voltage. And we're gonna try to transfer energy through it to in some manner, in some clo closed cycle manner to let us transfer energy from an input to an output and perhaps regulate an output. Okay, so we, we, we could do that in a variety of ways. Here's one example I'll show you. Uh, maybe I take this resonator and I first connect it between the input and the output. And then I maybe I open circuit the terminals and this element can resonate to itself. And then maybe I'll just short circuit the terminals of the resonator and let it resonate some more. And maybe I'll then let it open. Then maybe I'll connect it to the output, transfer some energy to the output, and let it resonate again so I can connect it to the input. Okay, um, and in each sequence, I'm using these open stages so that I can connect the resonator to the next place without sort of hard charging this capacitor, which would be lossy. And this is a big piezoelectric capacitance, okay? But so I have open stages that lead between different connected stages. In this case, this connected stage, I would call V in minus V out, zero and V out, because I connect the resonator between V in and V out, I short it, and then I connect it to V out. And what we require of some kind of cycle like this is that A, I get an energy balance over this cycle inside the resonator, right? Because I need to get to periodic steady state operation. I would also like to, have, I also need charge balance in this thing, right? So if we look at those constraints, I need energy balance and charge balance. We can go sort through all the possible cycles in the world that you could use a piezoelectric resonator of a given cycle length and with some constraints and find all of the ways you could do it. Okay, so we actually did that. And here's a set, now this is restricted to the set of six stage sequences. Uh, you can have higher stage sequences, but this is all the six stage sequences that can work and provide voltage regulation. Here's the regulation ranges that you can use to do it. Okay, and so now we have our hands around, how can I use a piezoelectric resonator only, no magnetics, to transfer energy in a closed loop fashion, okay? The other thing we could look at is, well, how efficient are these different modes, right? I'm sloshing energy around inside this resonator in order to transfer energy from the input to the output. Clearly they ought not all be the same, 
in terms of their performance, and they're not. So I could look at that. I could look at the efficiency, at least as considered the loss in the resonator. The loss in the resonator sort of depends upon how much amplitude of a current you need in that effective resonator branch, which you can relate back to things like the peak-to-peak -peak swing across that capacitor you need for the for the uh, for the resonance. Okay. I can also relate it to what we call the charge transfer utilization coefficient. This really says, you know, how much of my time connected to input and outputs am I effectively transferring energy to the output? Okay. But if we take these models, and I won't go into how you derive them, you can see that firstly, there's a great variation uh, in terms of the performance or the efficiency you can expect versus conversion ratio. You can also see that there's a great difference between the different ways of doing things. And in fact, actually the one I showed you, which was Vn minus V out, zero V out, is actually a pretty good one over a wide range. And this is plotted for some example material parameters, okay, or for or example resonator parameters. So we now know all the ways I can kind of have a closed loop cycle and use a piezoelectric resonator. We can then go identify all the minimum switch topologies that we can use to do those cycles. And some of these topologies apply to some cycles, some apply to others, some apply to multiple cycles, okay? But this gives us sort of the minimum set of topologies we might consider to use. We could have topologies with more switches, but this one sort of covers the minimum sets we can use, all right? So that's sort of an approach to getting a first hand around how can I use this new medium of energy storage as its own thing? Don't try to copy a resonant converter or something else, but use it in its native form to be an energy processing system, okay? This is just an experimental example of that. This is, um, this is one where I have this minimum number of switches. In this particular case, I can use diodes in pair, place of two of the switches. And I'd like to draw your attention to two things. First of all, there's no magnetics in this thing. The only element is the piezoelectric resonator here for transferring energy. I'd also like to point out that the experimental waveforms look exactly like the models. That sort of suggests that indeed the, the way we've been modeling these things works and the efficiencies match very well too, I should say. And lastly, I, I wanna just point out like, here's our efficiency. It's about 97%. So. Um, the efficiency is, um, you know, competitive with what you'd need. Um, th there was a question, do the mechanics of switching need to be smooth in some way to avoid losses to uneven switching on either side of the isolated element? Um, what you do need to do is make sure you never turn on a switch such that the voltage across this capacitor changes in instantly. Because if you do, you're going to get charging loss in that capacitor. Uh, and that's why we need to look at what ranges can things charge and discharge over. And that plays into what, what possible operating cycles will work. And there are other operating cycles, but they tend to be more complicated or have lower loss. Uh, what piezo, what frequency do the piezo resonator converter switch at? That depends on how you design the resonator, right? They're typically quarter wave resonators is what typically get used, so it depends on the speed of sound of the material and the size of the resonator. So that is all about the design of the resonator, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So moving on, um, I would argue that these initial results, uh, oh, another question, does it make noise? Well, the answer is yes, but you know, if it's noise at a 100 kilohertz or a megahertz, do you care? It makes, it does, it does, make noise, you'd like to minimize that anyways, um, but it doesn't make audible noise. Um, so, but I would argue that these results, so these are experimental results now, you know, show that the modeling is right and that there is the promise of high efficiency, right? Because we've shown we can get high efficiency. There's promise for better scaling to small size, integrated fact fabrication, but there's a lot of unknowns, right? How do you close, control these things in closed loop? what materials and piezoelectric operating modes are best, right? I, I showed an example resonator, but nobody ever said that was the best mode of resonance to use for highest efficiency or highest performance. 
um, how do you design the resonators and transformers for power conversion, not for everything else they've been designed for? And we're only really just beginning to answer these questions, but I'll give you some point, you know, some initial thoughts on that. Uh, coming back to this same V in minus V out, zero V out mode, right? We have two active switches and two passive switches in this example that turn on and off by themselves. That means I've got to decide when this switch turns on and off and this switch turns on and off, right? What we found is we can say, okay, we can get two of these edges by controlling for soft charging this capacitor. I can get one edge that's determined by maintaining zero voltage switching, which we want to go to high frequency. And the last edge I can use to control power flow for regulation, right? So this is just an example that says, okay, at least in this sequence, we can find a closed loop and then we have to find dynamic, we have to find a closed loop way to control it. It's not just that there exists a cycle, but I can find some dynamic way to control that cycle. And then we need models for it and designing closed loop controls. And that's one thing we've been doing. And there's some, I should say, by the way, there's some work on this in industry as well now. Another question that comes up is, well, you know, there's lots of piezoelectric materials out there. Which one should you choose, right? Earlier, I talked about the uh, performance factor for magnetic materials. It turns out that no such thing exists for piezoelectric magnetic materials for power conversion applications. There are figures of merit for other applications, just not for power electronics. Well, so we set out to look at that. So we said, okay, can I find a metric at least for one resonant mode of operation? And these results are for the thickness extensional mode of a resonator. Um, it turns out that I could, I could maximize the output power per unit loss in a material, so a maximum efficiency figure of merit, okay? And it turns out if you find the best point on that curve, um, you can get a result that's only in terms of material parameters. And by material parameters, we include things like maximum field intensity, maximum stress, maximum strain, quality factor of the material, coupling coefficient of the material, and so forth, okay? Just the way you can say, what's the best thing for efficiency? You can also ask, what's the highest power density you can get? Either um, volumetric power density, or in this case, aerial power density, because these tend to be very planar components. We're kind of concerned about how much area they take up. And you can, again, uh, write a figure of merit for a, given, for a given mode of operation in terms of only material parameters, okay? So that's good. If we go back, we can actually plot those against one another, right? So these are a whole bunch of materials. On this axis, I have the essentially the power density of figure of merit. Um, how many watts per millimeter squared can I process? In this dimension, I have the efficiency power metric, which is sort of how many watts can I put out per, per watt of loss, okay? I should say that there is a constraint on this, right? If I, even if I have really high power density, if my loss is too high, if I can't pull heat out of the material, then I can't use it, right? Uh, so we can say, okay, I can put a constraint, say a heat transfer limit, so many watts per centimeter squared of heat extraction I'm allowed. If I do that, then that's gonna constrain this, all right? But if I do that, what that says is we'd like to be in the top right-hand corner here, highest power per unit loss, highest power per unit area, okay? So that might make, say, this material here, pick 181, at least from its data sheet parameters, looks really, really good, all right? Now, I should have said, by the way, that this both play, both of these things play back into the geometry. It turns out this starts to give you a handle on how to design your piezoelectric geometry as well. Um, why? Because uh, if I wanna achieve minimum loss, that sets one factor about the resonator geometry. If I wanna achieve maximum density, it sets another factor. It turns out I can get both of these at the same time, which is wonderful, okay? So this is a way of saying, boy, we, we should be able to start picking materials and then optimizing resonators. Here is a example. Now this is simulation only. We're taking our models and saying, what do we think should be achievable if we design the resonator this way in the thickness vibration mode? And what this says is that we think we can get a power handling per cap area per, how, power handling per area of between three and four watts per millimeter squared, okay? At, losses that are tiny, well above 99%, okay? Now we haven't done this, 
but this is an extraordinary power density. This is far beyond any, any magnetic converter you're going to find anywhere today, right? And what that says is, at least based on the material properties, if you can optimize your choice of materials and choose your right operating mode and design it right and control it right, there are tremendous problem promise to jump very far ahead of wherever we are today. Now, there's a lot of work to be done, right? That's, that's a model, right? There's, you know, how do we design and optimize the piezoelectric resonators? I, I've said, everything I've said is actually about the thick, thickness extensional vibration mode, but you can have radial vibration modes, other vibration modes which lead you to different figures of merit. Maybe there's others that are even better, right? How do you realize those optimized designs? How do you fabricate them? How do you package them? There's all these very open questions because it's a very different way to do things. On the other hand, the promise is there to get to, to much higher levels of performance. I should say, by the way, there's also questions, what do you do with, you know, I've only talked about resonators. You can use piezoelectric transformers and get isolation and additional gain if you want, right? So there's a whole dimension there that we haven't explored. And there's other, turns out, very interesting architectural variants of systems that can leverage these. Uh, opportunities and sensing control. So there's, there's a big, you know, we're just starting. There's a big, long, open road ahead of us. But the point is, the promise, there's promise to go far, far beyond anywhere we are today. Okay. Um, I'd like to skip a little bit and focus on some of the other opportunities, in particular, um, opportunities to apply power electronics to benefit specific applications, OK? And, you know, there's a lot of applications we look at, you know, ranging from, um, oh, I'm sorry, there was a question. Does the vibration acoustic loss create in any new mechanical design constraints? Not new compared to things people have done in other contexts. People use piezoelectrics and microwave filters, they, they, and, 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 and resonators and other things, but it does create ones that are new in the context of power electronics, or relatively new. People did deal with those in doing the piezoelectric CCFL drivers, but I think there's a lot of intersection at the sort of, at the intersection of power and mechanical engineering there as well. Uh, it, but, it, a couple slides ago, you showed a picture of a piezoelectric resonator in a sort of test circuit, was that resonator something you built custom? No, that was one. That was just an off-the-shelf resonator. So, you know, we got that very high efficiency, but not the high density we would expect because that resonator wasn't designed to do this. Thanks. Um, coming back to the next kind of thing I wanted to talk about. There's a lot of application spaces that you could look at because we can do things with power electronics that just 10 years ago just simply weren't possible, okay? Um, and so one of the things we look at is developing power electronics solutions that are tailored to specific requirements of the application because we're not at a point yet where, you know, power electronics can do so much of what you want that you can just throw a generic circuit at anything. Right. So what we tend to look for is, first of all, what would give us high impact within a technical area? And secondly, what are kind of beachhead applications that would let us develop kind of fundamental technologies uh, that we can then spread into other areas? OK, and I'm going to show you one coming back to my theme of high frequency, because there's a lot of applications that require power at high frequency. That's three to 30 megahertz or very high frequency, 30 to 300 megahertz. Um, that traditionally use really low efficiency kind of crummy solutions. This is things like plasma generation for, for semiconductor processing, induction heating, wireless power transfer, and so forth. Okay. Now, one of the things that's challenging these applications, especially if you want to use switch mode power amplifiers and make everything efficient, um, is that you get load impedances that tend to dynam dynamically vary a lot over a wide range. If for a plasma system, like you're doing plasma processing, it depends on the gas, the pressure, the plasma state, how much power you're injecting to do your etching, what, uh, what other plasma driver is there in parallel with it, that kind of thing. And the load variation makes it really challenging to achieve high efficiency. And it also limits your ability to control the output, which are kind of the things we want to do with power electronics, high efficiency and control. So, you know, what do people do in the RF world? If I think about, you know, typically 
say for a plasma system that, that would be used for semiconductor processing, it might be typically 13.56 megahertz is a very typical number. Um, you know, they have some region in the Smith chart, this is in the reflection coefficient, but equivalently, you might think of it as regions in the real and reactive impedance, load impedance range, right? So what they do is they put a tunable matching network in there, right? Well, they'll have a pair of variable components that they will then uh, vary those components to match whatever this varying load is back to the desired, say, 50 ohms, okay? To do those variable components, most typical thing is something like a variable vacuum capacitor, right? This big, ugly thing, okay? And they'll mechanically have a stepper motor that'll mechanically tune the capacitor to get to the matching you want, right? So here's some examples. These are all, these use air bread slicer capacitors. This one uses a variable vacuum capacitor. The advantages of doing this is you get really wide impedance operation, very fine resolution over control. Uh, the inverter power amplifier only now has to see a single load. That's great. You get very high system efficiency. On the other hand, it's bulky. It's extremely, actually, relatively expensive. Va vacuum caps are incredibly expensive compared to semiconductor things. And very, very, you have mechanical time constant. I mean, it's just slow. And the problem is for the semiconductor industry is they want to control, you know, pulsing for etching. And that's very, very fast, right? And these things, these solutions just don't work. So we decided to take a look at that in part because we're interested in processing energy at these frequencies. <clears throat> Excuse me, here's a technique <clears throat> called phase switch impedance modulation. The basic idea is this, suppose I had a capacitor, I was gonna drive it with a current source in parallel with the switch. When the switch is on, this looks like a short circuit or sort of an infinite capacitor. When the switch is off, it just looks like a capacitor. So you could imagine at the AC frequency of this current waveform, if I turn, if I modulated the switch at that AC frequency, I ought to be able to sort of get some kind of modulation that gives me something somewhere between the capacitance and infinity, okay? Essentially what we do is we hold the switch on for a little while, let the voltage across the switch resonate up and down, when it gets down, you turn it on again, right? And by controlling the timing and the duration of the on state, we can get a ver effectively a variable capacitor, okay? So what's the promise? The promise is instead of these giant expensive slow things, maybe I can put all that into a transistor, get really fast response, fine tuning resolution, you know, hopefully high power levels, relatively low cost, all those things sound really good, okay? Now, what's the challenge? The notion of, by the way, doing this, you know, switch the capacitor on and off thing has been around at least since the 1980s, at kind of low frequencies. The challenge is, you know, if you want to do it for, impedance matching at HF, that's a whole different cup of tea. You can actually uh, do an analysis to say, okay, if I wanna do this phase switch impedance mat modulation, you know, what are the losses in the switch that I need to do it? And by the way, the capacitance we're talking about in parallel with the switch could just be the device junction capacitance, right? It could just be a switch if you like. Well, it depends on some of the operating parameters, what capacitance do you need? What modulation ratio do you want? But it also depends on the losses depend upon switch parameters, the product of the on-state resistance and the output capacitance. And it turns out, you know, with traditional silicon switches, this is just not quite good enough to make this efficient enough to be interesting at HF. But with the advent of wide band gap devices, GAN devices, silicon carbide devices, suddenly, if we can make everything else work, we could potentially use these devices to replace like sort of mechanical matching networks. So this is a way you could do it. Um, this is an example system for, I, I need two tunable elements. In this example I'm using, one is just a resonant tank. And if, if I have a high Q resonant tank, if I modulate frequency a little, I modulate this impedance. That's one control handle that would sort of take me this direction in the Smith chart. Uh, if I use phase switch impedance modulation, I can control the other part and then match everything back to 50 ohms. Okay, now in order to do this, I've got to control the duty ratio of this switch exactly synchronized to the RF input, right? So that that's kind of crazy. And I also need some other filter. This, this effective capacitance is only at the fundamental. I got to filter out the harmonics, which is why this networks here, okay? So, as I said, we got to switch, we got to synchronize this to the RF waveform. 
and then switch this with a control duty ratio that also maintains the zero voltage switching all the time. So that's pretty non-trivial, especially when we're at sort of tens of megahertz. But that's the opportunity, right? We can go design circuits to do that. So this is one way you might design such a, uh, a pulse width modulation generator at tens of megahertz to do this. We can use phase lock, cascaded phase lock loops that are controlled by their inputs, their point setting inputs to lock to an RF waveform and generate pulse widths that are timed with respect to that RF waveform, okay? And it turns out if you do this right, you can get very, very fast response. There's also other ways you could do it that are even better at even higher frequencies. The main limit on this one, while it's the one we've used, is the dynamics of the PLLs. But nonetheless, we're still gonna be way, way faster than any kind of mechanical system. So here's an example system where we did this. This is 1.5 kilowatt, 13.56 uh, megahertz system doing this, right? So here you can see this high Q output tank. That's this guy. Here you can see this PSIM network. This is GAN transistors with a very small external capacitance. That's this down here. We also have our low Q input tank. That's this here. We've also used uh, a, a transmission line transformer and some other voltage division to control the design this thing so we get the voltage on the transistors that we want. You can't see the controller. It's back in this shielded box back here. But what you can see here is this, this light blue waveform is the voltage across the transistor. You can see we're nicely zero volting switching this thing and we're controlling an impedance match from a very reactive load to very small impedance, highly reactive load up to 50 ohms across a wide range of powers and we're quite efficient. Even in conventional mechanical matching network, this is actually a very good efficiency. Okay, so the point is we can come in and take, you know, these nice power electronics techniques and bring them to an application where we get much, much higher performance. And I should say, by the way, this system, you know, whereas a typical mechanical system might tune in hundreds of milliseconds, this can do it in tens of microseconds. Right, so now we can enable entirely different new, different things in semiconductor manufacturing with this uh, than you could do with a conventional system. And the techniques, the pulse width modulation techniques, the soft switching techniques, all these kind of things can be applied directly back into many other kinds of applications that really aren't trying to do plasma generation, but maybe they can use high frequency PWM. So this solution, well, I've I've said this, so I'll, I'll keep going, and. You know, I've tried to make this kind of a whirlwind talk. I, I wanted to argue that there's a lot of challenges, um, but there's a lot of opportunities in power electronics. One is to really push towards much higher frequency converters, 10x what people are conventionally doing today. Great reductions in energy storage, passives, higher bandwidth, a lot of good things there. Uh, to do that, we really want improved passive components and integration. So we need better magnetics designs, there's also the possibility of using alternatives that people really haven't done historically because of the complexity of trying to do it, uh, such as piezoelectrics. Uh, there's also the opportunity to bring a greater degree of sophistication topologies. And I didn't really focus on that much except in that PFC application, but there's a lot of opportunity to bring more sophisticated controls to get us to higher frequencies or to get us to lower energy storage. And lastly, there's a lot of opportunity to advance power electronics applications because we can do things that were traditionally just off the table. And so really we, there's a whole, I mean, the, the amount of applications that are gonna undergo a revolution in the next decade is tremendous. And with that, I will uh, sort of conclude and I'll be happy to take any further questions. All right, awesome. Thanks Dave for that whirlwind tour, that was, Really awesome and fun to see all of that. Um, all right, any questions from anyone? Feel free to jump I'll, in. I'll ask a question. Um, so you talked about, you know, piezos. Uh, I mean, quartz crystals are obviously a very mature, uh, you know, piezoelectric, you know, technology. Is there any application for those in in some of these applications? I mean, maybe for low power. So the answer to that, I, I actually tried using a quartz crystal at one point for fun, but um, the answer to that comes back to these kinds of figures of merit, right? 
because it's, you, you have to say, well, what is the coupling coefficient, the electrical mechanical coupling coefficient that plays into your figures of merit, for example, right here, K33 in this particular case, right? So it turns out quartz um, has very high quality factor, but not so high coupling coefficient, right? So I probably wouldn't use that. On the other hand, a lot of the PZT materials, because they have pretty high inertia, are, are much better. So your, your question's well-founded, right? I'm not going to use Rochelle salt. I'm not going to use quartz, but what should I use? And that's where it would lead me to kind of compare all these different materials or even, you know, use these kind of metrics to drive materials development for power electronics, right? Because people developing materials, that's not, you know, this is not what they're optimizing for. They're optimizing for entirely different um, functions. Thanks. I had a question. Um, so in the, I guess in the, the circuit that you made with the piezo, um, you were talking about using feedback control to sort of optimize. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, so what kind of sensor would you use for that? Uh, and I assume you'd have like a microcontroller um, sort of right there next to the circuit. Um, I, and it seems pretty slow. So any, almost any microcontroller would do, I suppose. And um, uh, is there an upper limit that you would be looking for um, for such a sort of optimal control problem or online learning of it? Sure. So, so, and by the way, in a lot of these things, there is the op opportunity to mix feed forward and feedback. Okay. Um, in this particular case, the only thing we were using to control, we were, we're, we're not looking at any of the currents and we don't have the internal states, nor did we even, you know, think of using an observer or something like that, which you could do. The only thing this control mechanism relied upon was measuring voltages. And that's intentional because if you want to go to high frequencies, measuring currents is difficult. Okay. Um, what the dynamics look of that look like is another question, right? You have two, you have two questions. This answers the question, what am I physically going to control in order to make this thing a closed loop system? Another question is what do the dynamics of that thing look like? And that I didn't address at all. Um, but in terms of sensing, um, you could keep going up in frequency with this. The thing that will limit you eventually is, you know, if I need to detect sort of example for this case, I want to do zero voltage turn on or something like that, these two edges, uh, I need a comparator fast enough to do that, right? So if I have a two nanosecond delay in my capacitor, in my, compar in my uh, comparator, and five nanoseconds delay in my switch driver that that sets an upper bound but these days you know if we're talking about the region of 10 megahertz which was the example i gave that would be high power density it's quite doable thank you i don't know if that quite answers your question no, and, I, but I, there's I, a lot of open questions no, about I, what are the dynamic models and how would you design the controllers entirely open field yeah that sounds really interesting i just wanted you to talk about it more really so thanks Hey Dave, yeah, this piezoelectric stuff is is really fascinating. And whenever you reach this point where you have a given circuit with some input output characteristics you need, and then you look at this map of these materials and you say, this is the material I want to use. And that if you had a blank slate, you choose the optimal geometry. And then from there, the next question is, is who do you go to? <laughs> to fabricate and build this thing. So what does that actually look like? That's a very good question. There, there are some manufacturers. I mean, as was mentioned, right? There's crystal manufacturers. There's a lot of piezoelectric manufacturers for a lot of things whom you could go to to get things made. Uh, there is also the opportunity to do some of these things yourself, you know, electroplate, you know, things like electroplating, etching. So we've done some things where we've taken existing non-isolated structures and gone and etched our own electrodes and things like that. But, you know, that that's where you want to start talking to your MEMS colleagues who are really good at these things um, and do that. So we're, we're, do, we're looking at both. We're, we're talking to people outside and we're making some of our own stuff. And that is a challenge with this area, right? If you want to push research forward in this area, it's not like, you know, if you want to design a, if you want to go get some magnetic cores ground to your spec or, or, you know, made to your spec, it's not a big deal because there's a huge industry around it. 
this there's less of a big industry there's a fewer fewer players there's fewer materials and so you just got to struggle but it, it's some combination of there are a few people that can make things for you uh if you have the budget to do it and you can also do it in your own you know if you if you have a semiconductor fab like we do we can do some of these steps ourselves plating and etching and things like that and grinding very cool anyone else have any questions here i guess if oh let's see we have a question from uh, branco he says if we want to use 10 megahertz switching frequency converters at high current applications are there going to be limitations in terms of turn off loss and gate driving loss? So um, gate driving loss is not so much connected to current, but rather what voltage you're operating at, right? So if I have a converter that's operating at high voltage, where the drain source voltage is relative to the gate source voltage I need to the transistor, the gating loss tends not to be big. When I get down to CMOS scales where the gate drive voltage and the output capacitor voltage of the device are equal, then it tends to be dominated by the gating loss. Okay. Um, now, we've, we've built um, converters running at, well, actually we've built converters running at past 100 megahertz. But um, when I look at sort of this three to 30 megahertz range, uh, with the available transistors, if, if you're looking in the spaces where you can use GAN or silicon carbide, um, it's much, much easier than it used to be, believe me. Like trying to do it with silicon devices is tough. Doing it with GAN devices is not much of a problem, frankly, at those frequencies. Um, the losses you do have is not so, and you, by the way, if you have to, you can use resonant gate drives, but that introduces other concerns. But you have to say, when I want to switch timed relative to my gate time constant is what it comes down to. But for GAN transistors and to a lesser extent for silicon carbide, you know, 10 megahertz, no problem. <clears throat> How sensitive is the operation of the converter of the piezo resonator parameters? That's a good question. Uh, another question, uh, that's not so much a problem, it's a question of how much are the piezo resonator parameters sensitive to things like temperature and other stuff, right? I mean, a quartz crystal, you go out and buy it because it's a it's a frequency standard. The frequency is not going to move, period, right? It's basically geometry and the speed of sound in that material. Other materials, the density changes with temperature and you get into these problems. It's an open question, I think, frankly, uh, in terms of these materials that operate at high performance. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of people who know a lot about locking to resonances like Brian, <laughs> who, who can come up with a good, really good solutions to these kind of things. Um, so I, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't want to trivialize it. I think there's a lot to be done there and there's opportunity to figure things out. I don't think that's a, uh, a reason you can't go in that direction because keep in mind your magnetics are also temperature sensitive and you deal with those. Okay, we're nearing the end of the half hour mark. Any last questions? Okay, I just saw the clock change. We're, we're right at the half hour mark. So I guess on that note, let, let's thank Dave one more time for the fantastic talk. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us.